And first off, I want to say thank you for inviting me to participate in Think Test 2013. Though I'm sad I couldn't be here in person, um, I'm hoping that this will be seen as uh, the next best thing. I am hoping that I could be invited to uh, participate in Think Test 2014. And uh, I guess that means that those of you who are watching this, you have a lot of control over whether or not that can happen. So if you like this talk and if you like my presentation and the way that I do things, um, please definitely mention to the uh, Think Test organizers that you'd like to have me participate in person. And maybe we can arrange that for next year. Just had to put that in. Uh, so let's get some stuff out of the way first. Uh, who am I? Why would you care that uh, I'm here talking to you? Uh, well, first off, my name is Michael Larson, and I am a software tester. I have been, uh, basically, directly or indirectly, for 20 years. Since I started my career at Cisco Systems in 1991, and in various roles since then for a variety of other companies, including Connectix, Synaptix, Konami Digital Entertainment, Tracker Corp, Sidereel, and where I currently call my place of work now, which is Social Text. Um, I'm a black belt in the Miyagi-Do School of Software Testing. I serve on and work with the Board of Directors of the Association for Software Testing. I am a black box software testing instructor, as well as the chair of the Education Special Interest Group, which means that teaching the black box software testing courses through the Association for Software Testing, AST, that's my thing. That's what I do. It's one of the things that uh, I enjoy doing, and I like being able to interact with all the people that participate in these classes. Uh, they're intense, they're very demanding, and th I, I personally think they're a lot of fun. Uh, so there's my plug, had to get that out of the way. Um, let's see, what else can I say? I am a founder and facilitator of the Weekend Testing Americas chapter, uh, and proud to be an ambassador of a fantastic program that started here in India, and with uh, some amazing people who I still communicate with and still confer with and still consider my mentors in regards to how to run this program effectively. I think it's an amazing opportunity. And if anybody here has never participated in weekend testing, please, please definitely go to weekendtesting.com and have a chat and talk to some of the uh, coordinators and organizers and get in on the next session. I think you'll really enjoy it. And it's a great place to improve your craft. And I'm proud of being part of it. Uh, I am also, uh, I also write a blog dedicated to software testing topics called Test Head. Um, in fact, a lot of what you're going to be seeing in this talk uh, originated on that blog, on my blog, and a great deal of what I'm talking about here is going to be going through a lot of the history that got me to why I'd be even talking to you today. Uh, also, if you happen to be on Twitter and you want to see me tweet about software testing, because it's my primary mode of communication when it comes to talking about software testing, you can follow me on Twitter at MKLTestHead. By the way, for this talk, I'm leaving this space here open for much of what we're doing, and that way you might see pictures pop in here or a little guideline talking about what, we are, what it is we're doing. And the main purpose for this is we want to be able to make this as interactive, engaging, and something that you will want to view, and later, I hope, maybe want to share. All right, with that out of the way, the title of my talk is In Through the Side Door. And, you know, it's basically my life story. Well, my life story in testing and some other interesting things that helped inform how I got here. And it really is, in my, the way I like to say it is, it's a lifetime of unconventional choices and how I was able to make a career in a space that many people said I had no business being in in the first place. More about that later. There's a lot of ups and downs. There are definitely mistakes I've made. There are things I've learned. There are things I wish I learned. There are highs, there are lows. I've been through every emotion imaginable uh, when it comes to software testing, and I'm still here. And I wanna share a little bit about why that is. And I also want to maybe counsel some people to think about testing in a different way and think about the mindset and the approach that might help inform what makes a good tester and why you might want to consider somebody 
who doesn't fit the predefined box that uh, has been often defined. Um, this talk may get embarrassing. It may get a little personal. In fact, I can guarantee it's going to get embarrassing and personal for me. And that's on purpose. The point of the matter is I want to share information that is not what you're normally going to hear. You're not going to hear set, you know, pat strategies. I'm not going to offer you best practices. Much of what I've done in my career has been serendipitous. It's been luck-based. It's been something that I honestly never thought I'd see. I never believed I'd be here. It wasn't what I was aiming for at all. But I got here and decided I could do something with this. And I thought that was pretty cool. So without further ado, I'm going to shut up on the basics. I'm going to get into the bulk of my talk. It makes sense in a talk like this to kind of start from the beginning. So I'm going to kind of start from the beginning. And I'm going to start with a revelation, if you will, that's probably to anybody who knows me, completely not a revelation. Uh, it's blindingly obvious. Uh, for those who know me and who know the way that I interact with people and how I talk, um, I have ADHD. I also am mild. I also factor fairly, you know, depending on how you want to look at it on the, uh, on what would be referred to as, uh, having some, having some semblance of a spectrum disorder. And I'm totally okay with that. And I mention that not because I'm looking for anybody to be sympathetic or to say, oh, wow. It just is. It's who I am. And it's important because that who I am is what helps make me, interestingly enough, a good candidate for being a tester. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why that is. First off, uh, for anybody who knows anything about ADHD and what it actually is, most people who have it generally are associated with being hyperactive and jumpy, and that's me, absolutely. I am hyperactive, I am all over the map, I am very action-oriented, I you know, thrive energy, I thrive movement and interesting stuff, I have a very short attention span. Um, I also have what I call a dichotomy in the sense that while I do have a short attention span, I also have another telltale sign. And that telltale sign is what I call the obsessive fixation. The obsessive fixation comes in all over my life. I see it when I go back in time and I look at uh, the various years that I was growing up, I can find lots of them. Uh, the one that I remember the best and that I really can say, you know, kind of set the stage for this was in second grade in my love of dinosaurs. Now, I don't just mean I liked dinosaurs or I liked drawing them or had a collection of them. No, I mean I was so into dinosaurs that I think I memorized every known at that time to a kid that would be growing up in you know, the Western United States, every single dinosaur that was known to man, at least that I knew of at that time. And for a second grader, that's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I knew about the various ages, I knew about rocks, I knew about paleontology, the sediment formations. I got so into it, and I just breathed it. It was my every waking moment. I talked about dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs all the time. And interestingly enough, right about the end of my second grade year, uh, I stopped talking about dinosaurs. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not that I don't like them, I'm not... It's not that I'm not interested in them. I am, totally. I still totally dig them. But nothing like that period. And I think it was something having to do with the fact that it was mine, I could learn about it, and I could go as deep as I wanted to go. And once I went as deep as I felt I wanted to go, I was okay with that. And I thought, great, okay, time to do something else. So, I mean, I've had many different little fixations over the course of my life. Uh, you know, during the time that I was you know, in third grade, uh, the Revolutionary War in the United States uh, was my obsession, which is pretty easy to understand because it was, 17, it was 1976. It was the bicentennial of the signing of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And a lot was going on about that at that time. So it was a natural thing to dive into right then. Uh, in fourth grade, I was obsessed with chemistry. I wanted to know everything there was about chemistry. Sadly, it didn't follow me into high school when I actually took chemistry classes, but then I was really into it. And I was totally in love with chemistry and chemical reactions and how things worked. 
Uh, during my fifth grade year, my obsession had to do with the rock band Kiss. I just did. I, they were larger than life kind of cartoon characters. Uh, and just, to me, an absolutely amazing phenomenon. And I loved everything about them. I collected everything I could find. Uh, let's see, during fifth grade, I was into you know, a number of other things. I, I, all, I, you know, playing soccer, I was into skiing, I got into martial arts, I got into photography, um, got into singing with vocal groups, like choruses. Um, also, interestingly enough, in my senior year of high school, I got an interesting chance, I was, which might look a little strange now, but I was actually offered an opportunity to by a modeling agency to be a fashion model. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't a big career, not great chase with it, but it was very interesting in that it taught me some interesting things about myself that I wasn't aware that I knew how to do or that I should be doing. And so I guess you could say that that was when the self-marketing and understanding a little bit about how to sell yourself has a lot to do with how people interact with you and how they perceive you. Before I was trying to do any work as a model. I was very shy, I was aloof, I was you know, not somebody that people would approach. Um, did not have a whole lot of friends, interestingly enough, um, just because I just didn't have anything that was noteworthy and I just didn't feel like I stood out. Well, once I became a, once I became a fashion model, I stood out and people started to talk to me, you know, because I was interesting, I guess. And that was a really big boost because it gave me the first inkling of what I really wanted to do. And that thing that I really wanted to do, which is also what ran throughout most of my life, was I wanted to be a musician. And that was one of the most important things to me in the sense that I really wanted to make a band, I wanted to go perform. And I just thought, you know, okay, well, let's give it a try. That'll probably be a short-lived thing too, and I'll get that out of my system and go on and do something else. Not at all. It actually turned into a ten, almost 10 year long obsession. And I focused all of my core energy and all the, everything about what I did into it. Downside, uh, school took a very low priority. I started out on 15 units in college and then dropped to 12 and then nine and then six. And some semesters I dropped out entirely because I was much more interested in doing whatever I could to make money so that I could have enough money so that we could rent a rehearsal space so that we could have band practice so that I could print flyers so that I could go out and promote shows so that we could play and get people to know us and buy our music. That's what we did. And that was what was really important about that involvement at that time. What I didn't realize though was, at least then, was that I was really learning a lot of skills and skills that most people don't learn in school. When you are going out and you have a thousand flyers in your hand and you need to get those thousand flyers either into people's hands or onto walls or set up somewhere so that people can see them, you're doing direct marketing. When you are following up with people and you're trying to get tickets sold, you are doing direct sales. When you are engineering and writing music, you are being creative, you are actually producing. And when you create a stage show and you try to make sure that your lights and your music and your musical equipment and the logistics of what your stage setup is, there's actually a whole lot of engineering and a whole lot of production that goes into that. And being able to have those experiences were vital. I didn't realize it at the time, but they laid the groundwork for what happened for me in 1991 when I actually had to get serious because I was basically in the situation of I was drowning in debt. And uh, while we look to be right at the edge of being famous and becoming superstars, sadly it didn't happen, you know, just for all sorts of reasons. But I had to do something and I had to do something to keep me afloat or else I was going to be in a very bad situation. And my drummer at the time said, you know what, what you probably want to do is do what I did. And uh, I went to a temp agency and they got me a job with an electronics company and I'm a sales rep with them now and I actually do pretty well. Okay, got nothing to lose, why not? And I went to a temp agency and I basically asked them, can you do two things for me? Can you find me a day gig so I don't have to work at night? And can you find me a gig that won't mind that I have 
long hair and need to keep that. It's funny now because I don't have any hair, but back then having long hair in the late 80s was very important if you were a musician. And they did. They followed through. And what they did was they said, hey, we do have a gig for you. We'd love to have you, uh, you know, come out and try it out and see what you think. And I said, great. Well, who's it with? I said, oh, um, it's with a small um, computer company down in Menlo Park, California. Uh, they're called Cisco Systems. Okay. I didn't know who Cisco Systems was, but I went. And when I got there and I was introduced to a number of the people that were in the company, I saw all these interesting people with you know, long hair and Grateful Dead t-shirts or rock t-shirts or you know, hanging around in shorts. I said, who are these people? I said, oh, those are our engineers. Do they um, get to, do, get to you know, look like that all the time? And the answer was, they make our product. They can pretty much do anything they want to. But I decided right then and there, I didn't care what this company was or what they made or what I had to do. I was going to work here whatever it took. More about that. Okay, so at this point, let's take a little segue. And I want to talk about, you know, from these formative years, what are some things that I learned in this process? Um, you know, there's a few things I want to put in here. Let me start this again, actually. So what can we make of this interesting collection of experiences that, uh, frankly, that I felt immediately made me less than qualified to work in software testing or anyplace else. Well, what I discovered was uh, from an early age, the idea of exploration and learning on my own and just pouring over trivia and minutia, wow, that, that proved to be an excellent training ground for being a software tester. It really did. And I found that I was not just interested in that something happened, but I really needed to know why it happened. I felt if I couldn't get to the why, the what was almost meaningless. I think that was what stemmed from a lot of the things that I was really obsessed about, was how can you do it? Why is it important to do it? And can I do it? And once I can do it, can I do more of it? And that is really a great training ground for developing the mind of a tester. Um, I had the chance to look at knowledge from many different perspectives uh, because a lot of the time I was making things up as they went along. I didn't have access to a lot of the tools. I wasn't going about learning about things in a prescribed manner. I was actually, you know, winging it much of the time. And so my own natural curiosity jumped in and said, hey, there's a lot of things we can do here. And I want to make sure that I learn as much of it as I can. And I just, you know, sucked it up. It was wonderful. And I discovered early on that sometimes school was hit and miss. Things I loved learning about when I was studying it on my own, or when I was finding out about it on my own. When I learned about it in classrooms, it just it bored me to tears. Because I wasn't learning what I wanted to know. I wasn't finding out things that interested me. I was checking in marks and filling in bubbles that matched the answers on the test. And a lot of the answers on the test, I wasn't all that interested in. I was much more interested in the side things, the things that were going on in the background that we weren't really reading much about. You know, I was immensely interested in and tremendously excited during the time that we were talking about the American Revolutionary War. They had all these facts and figures about the American Revolutionary War. And one question, one question about the Native American tribes that fought on the side of the British and that fought on the side of the Americans, and why. I thought that was fascinating, and I dug so much up about that. And I was a little frustrated that that was barely getting a mention. And so again, my discovery and my interest in looking at things from my own perspective had much more of an impact on me and what I learned than anything I was learning in school. I discovered that I like to write, but I really didn't like writing term papers and you know, based on their hard requirements. I wrote a lot of bad poetry. Um, when you're a lyricist and when you write music and write lyrics, yeah, you're going to write a lot of bad poetry. If you read most lyrics outside of the scope of the music they're with, they're pretty, they're pretty pretentious and ridiculous. Um, but still, I discovered writing from many different perspectives. I discovered philosophy for the first time. 
And I found that I liked talking about different ways of looking at the world, even if I didn't agree with them. I thought it was really interesting to learn as much about it as I could. And that, made, and that was exciting. Um, I also discovered that a lot of skills, uh, you know, come into play when you decide you want to make a band. You know, I, I looked at myself as though I was a singer or a songwriter or a performer, and that's basically it. What can I do with that? You know, what I didn't realize, break. I discovered that a lot of skills come before when you, you know, create a band, when you want to be a musician, when you want to be a performer. I thought that just being a performer was the whole deal. No, not at all. In fact, there's so much that goes on throughout the course of the day. If you look at the 100% of being in a band and being a musician, 95% of your time is not even on stage. It's not performing. It's doing everything else to get you to that point. Um, it's rehearsing. It's, you know, yes, but there's more to it. Building bands was very much like building a startup. It was me being an entrepreneur. It was me being a technician. I was being a salesperson. I was being a marketeer. I was a designer. More than anything else, though, I was a creator. And I learned what it meant to create from start to finish and try to deliver a genuine quality product to the best of our ability. Um, that's going to mean different things to different people. But for us and for what we were doing at the time, it was really important to us that we put on the best show we could. We gave 100% of our energy and attention. And one of the great things, you know, especially when you're that young and you don't really know what the rest of the world has to offer for you or what's in store for you, uh, you've got nothing to lose. And that was something that was really valuable to me, was me realizing I had nothing to lose. Um, those traits actually stood me in very good stead when I got to Cisco Systems. I wasn't aware of the fact that I really did spend a lot of time. I spent a lot of attention on designing flyers. I spent a lot of time and attention on making sure that we had enough money in the bank or that we were making our payments or that we were you know, balancing our books right. If we were taking out an ad someplace, how much did that cost and how many tickets did we have to sell? I was managing spreadsheets. I was writing up I, I stored everything. I had a contact database that we kept and I maintained it. And I did everything I could to keep it up to date, and change it and modify it as we got more information. And by doing that, by the time that I actually got into Cisco and I was actually talking with them and the questions came up to, well, what's your, what's your skills? What's your experience? I actually found out I had a lot of experience and a lot of skills and that I approached things from an avenue that was very unique to them. One of the best examples of this was the first two days I was there. I was actually hired just to clean out their engineering library. And because I'd been a housekeeper for several years, that was what paid the bills while I was a musician, what they expected would take two weeks, I did in two days. And so they had plenty of time and me on the clock and, well, what can we do with this guy? And they introduced me to a bunch of people in the company. And in particular, they introduced me to the lady that was running the release engineering lab. And I went to talk with her. And as I was talking with her, and I was looking around the lab and I saw the layout of the machines and I saw the racks and the routers and the switches and other things that we had in place. Mouse connecting, fat ethernet, I mean, every, every possible connection point you could think of, we had it in this lab. Machines on one side, machines on the other side, and a couple of racks that had patch panels almost exclusively. And as I looked at the patch panels, I thought to myself, hey, wait a minute. When I was in college, I wired up our recording studio, and I learned a lot about signal processing. And I learned a lot about routing signals through patch panels. And I just did this mental jump. And the mental jump that I did was I said, hey, wait a minute. I know what this is. This is like a recording studio with fatter cable. And if that holds, there's a lot that I could do here. And I think I can make this work. And so I said, basically, hey, do you need help managing this lab? I'd be happy to do it. 
what can I do for you? What do you need? And the lab administrator at the time actually said, there's a lot that I need. I would love to have you help me with this. Um, hey, let's, you know, and so I did. And I just grabbed cables and I climbed up into the cable raptors and I wired whatever I could and worked on my belly and did everything. And the point was, they said, wow, this guy's really interested in doing whatever, whatever it takes. And that morphed into my doing a job where they put me in front of what was at that time called a Bitech programmer, and they had little EEPROMs, several of them. And you would program those EEPROMs, and you would stick them into you know, a board, a system board, plug them into a chassis, and fire up a terminal window, and issue some commands, and see what comes back. And if you do some basic commands, and they come back, can you get those? Then yeah, what you have is you have a system that works, and then it can you can do more with it, you can give it to somebody else to do further testing. What I didn't realize until later was I developed a great relationship with these people in release engineering. And they became my mentors and they became my friends. It wasn't until a couple years later that I kind of came to the conclusion, hey, release engineering, they're the software testers. And I'm one of them. One of the great things about working for Cisco Systems in the early 1990s was that it was a company that was on a insane growth curve. Uh, it really was like strapping yourself onto a rocket. There was so much work and so much they needed to do and they could not hire enough people to do it. And me as a temp coming in there, it was a great opportunity because I, I could do as much as they would let me do. If I wanted to come in at seven o'clock in the morning and leave at 10 o'clock at night, as long as I could justify the hours I was doing and I could show what I did, sure, do whatever. If you work overnight because you're doing a lab build out, great, do what you gotta do. It's, they, they really genuinely gave me a wide, wide latitude and said, learn whatever you wanna learn, do whatever you wanna do. Internalize this as much as you possibly can. And I did, I had that amazing insight, I guess, to say, this could be something, I don't know. But if they've got this much work and so much is going on and I keep hearing this great news about new sales and record quarters and whatever, okay, cool, I'm, I'm in, it sounds fantastic. And so I would, and so for the period of about, you know, nine, 10 months, I really did. I put my everything into it, even while I was playing, even while I was a musician and performing. And the interesting thing was that as I was doing that and as I was getting better, as you know, lab administrator, doing my EEPROM stuff, testing basically, uh, the music industry was changing. The scene that I was part of had morphed into something very different. Um, you know, Nirvana came on the scene with Smells Like Teen Spirit and all of us that were in the line of music that I was doing were looking at that going, hmm, that's different. I didn't really look at it as different. I said, hey, that might make us obsolete. And I was proved right. And the music changed into something that I really wasn't having as much fun performing. It was very dark and sinister and serious and brooding and somber. And that just wasn't me. It wasn't what I wanted to do as a performer. And at this point also, my bandmates were saying, hey, you know what? We kind of think it's a good time for us to go to LA because if we're really going to make this happen, I think we're poised for that breakthrough. Before I said I had nothing to lose, now all of a sudden I did. And it was really interesting to me. I thought, how am I gonna break away from 10 years of my life? Well, I came to some very stark conclusions. And the simple fact was a lot of what the music scene had turned into wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And what I was learning in at Cisco was exciting me. It was making me really pumped up. And I enjoyed what I was doing. And I got a high off of it. And I was like, yes, I want to keep doing this. And so I made that choice. I said, you know what? Maybe it's time to put my band-aids behind me, at least for now. And I, I let it go. And I said, I'm going to focus on whatever it's going to take to succeed here at Cisco. And that's basically what I set out to do for the next 10 years. I went from being a lab administrator into being a software tester on a team focusing on routers and switches, into being a somewhat lone tester focusing on network management protocols, 
working on a flow collector, a NetFlow flow collector that was its own application way off to the side. And I was the only tester that was working on that one for almost three years. It was three, three iterations of the product I went through. And by the time I got to the end of those three years, I was like, oh, please let me do anything but this flow collector, I beg you. And so I got a chance, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm starting, I'm joined this new group over, that, that was actually an acquisition. I joined them and they're making you know, web caching and content routing. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I'd like to take a look at that. And so for the next couple of years, that's what I focused on. And after 10 years of working at Cisco, I kind of got to the point to where I said, hey, you know what, man? I'm feeling pretty confident here. I can test just about anything. This is really kind of cool. And uh, the, t that 10 years also coincided with the crash of the dot-com boom. And so a lot of the benefits and the reasons why I would have stayed at Cisco, because well, their stock price was going up, and that was really, really appealing to me, well, that wasn't there anymore. And it wasn't such a, such a driver any longer. By this time, I'd married, and I had I had three, three children that were young, and I thought, I want to be able to spend more time with them. And so I started looking for a job that was closer to home. And that started the next wave of my career, which was a little bit uh, scattered, but very educational. So again, let me sum up some of these things from these years. You know, if you're lucky enough to find a company that has more work than people that it can do, just volunteer for anything, seriously, to say, what do you need? I'll do it. I'll, even if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to figure it out. You know, even the best and most accomplished engineers don't know everything. They can't cover 100% of the ground. And this is a great avenue for people who come from not necessarily technical backgrounds to start to specialize and say, hey, you know, what is the things that you're, you know, what, what do you not know so much? You know, look for gaps. Look to see what people do or don't know. And if you find something that's missing, start studying up on it and start figuring out what it would take to understand it better and to be much more involved. And that's really valuable because it shows not just that you are interested in learning, but it also shows that you're looking to fill a hole that's currently unfilled. They don't have to go outside for that. One of the things that I found really interesting also when I was helping to interview other testers over the years I must have interviewed hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of testers. Uh, and I always found it kind of frustrating, but interesting, that I was interviewing people who I felt were light years ahead of me in knowledge and skill and understanding. And when I was interviewing them and we'd come out of the interviews, well, we're not going to go with this person. They don't have this level of understanding. They, they haven't done this. They, you know. And I'm going, wait a minute. You wouldn't hire them, but you hired me. I'm confused. And that was when a phrase first got introduced to me. And that phrase was, yeah, Michael, you came in through the side door. And interesting things happen when you come in through the side door. And that's been a metaphor that I've used. And again, it's right here in this talk. It's the title of this talk. When you come in through the side door, you have the ability of doing things in a very unorthodox way. And because you have the ability of doing things in an unorthodox way, you have very often a lot of latitude to what you want to do. When you're hired straight through the front door, you oftentimes have a very set expectation. And that set expectation doesn't give you a lot of leeway to do different things because you need to cover that ground that they hired you for. That's what they expect of you. At least that was my experience up to this point in time. You know, it was really exciting to be able to work with all these groups and learn from all these different people and try all these different hats on. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of very interesting and engaging work. But I felt also that I was running into the danger of being too narrow. It was all about networking. It was all about routing and switching and I didn't know much about anything else. I didn't really test much when it came to, you know, PC applications or uh, at the time the primitive mobile devices, which like the like the Palm Pilot or anything like that. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. 
and I thought it might be a good idea to branch out into something different. And so I did. And that's what brought me to Connectix in 2001. And it's also what started me working in an environment called, called application engineering. Application engineering is a weird, weird space. It has a very definite understanding in manufacturing. It has a very definite understanding in you know, very structured environments. But for the next two years, I would work for companies where I was an application engineer. And if you ask five different people, what does an application engineer do? They gave you five different answers. And this was also at the time when the dot-com situation got to be kind of ugly. And because the dot-com situation got to be kind of ugly, I got laid off for the first time in my career. In fact, I got laid off uh, three times in the course of the ensuing five years between when I left Cisco and went to my next longest tenure job, which I'll talk about in a little bit. When I first joined Cisco, there were 300 people working for the company. When I left Cisco 10 years later, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 45,000 people working for the company. So that gives you an idea just how much growth had happened. And it was amazing. It was really a fantastic place to have worked. And it was a fantastic environment to have grown up in. Uh, but at the same time, I decided at that point, it was time for me to go and see what else was out there. And I wanted to find something closer to home. And when I did so, I went to Connectix. And Connectix brought me in as an application engineer, meaning they basically just wanted to have me there to work on whatever. In a way, it was kind of like, a, in their worldview, it was kind of a glorified support role, but it was also working with QA, working with the developers, doing rapid response, focusing on like big ticket uh, bug or customer problems. And that was fun, that was interesting. It was a way of doing firefighting and it was getting into the heads of the customer service representatives that we were working with, some of which were actually really, really sharp. And they were very focused and very uh, proactive in the way that they solve problems. I started looking at that and saying, you know, the people who work as uh, customer support engineers, they would make fantastic testers. And several of them actually did. Later on, they would move on into roles where they were actually testing. While I was there, and while I was focused on that environment, uh, I had a chance to basically, again, call my own shots, do whatever I wanted to do, because at the time the economy was humming along pretty well, and there were a lot that were a lot of things that we thought were very promising. What I didn't see coming around the corner was a big crash and correction, both in a stock market sense and in a sense of who was employable. After 10 years of working at Cisco, again, coming in through the side door, and because of a friend over at Connectix also coming in through a side door, I didn't really get that, you know, we're looking to fill this role and you're coming in to fill that role. I had a lot of leeway. And so I thought, wow, this is really great. This is how everybody should be working. This is, you know, take on whatever uh, comes your way. When an economy gets sour, that's not so easy to do. And yes, I found myself being laid off and for the first time having to think, oh no, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna work? And so I went and I, again, talked to a number of friends, tried to see where I could go. And this time I did actually do a direct interview. And because of enough experience and knowing the people, as somebody who knew me and who knew of my, my past uh, history and kind of, over the top attitude, I said, well, hey, why don't, you, why don't you come over here to Synaptics? We think this might be an interesting place for you. You might have a good time working here. And when I came in, I thought, yeah, sure, I can do this. Again, I'm a tester. I worked 10 years at Cisco. I worked a year at Connectix. I can test anything. I genuinely believe that. And this was the first time I learned that, well, maybe you can and maybe you can't. Because when I got to Synaptics, I realized that, yeah, they had software, but their software was much more firmware driver. It was much more, hey, if you put your finger on this touchpad and move it, how far does the mouse move? If you put this much pressure on a touch stick, will the mouse respond? If you apply a certain amount of electrostatic discharge at a varying rate, 
when does the unit stop working? If you have different mechanical properties of the covering, what is that going to do in the way that it affects the way that the mouse moves? This was where I started to panic a little bit. I thought, wow, wait a minute, this is very different. This is not me testing software. This is me testing natural phenomena. This is me looking at physics. One of the first assignments I had was to make a recommendation for which adhesive we were going to go to market with for creating the uh, touch pads and the plates that they attach to. And that's when I went, wow, I'm looking at something that's very different than what I'm used to. And I wasn't sure that I had the domain knowledge to actually do that. As it turned out, actually over time, I didn't have the domain knowledge or the depth of it. Um, but I just kind of kept on thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. It's all right. I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to work to work to understand what I have to do. And I don't want to make it sound like this was a bad gig. It, really, it actually was quite fun and there was a lot of neat things I got to do, especially working with the ESD gun. Uh, if you've never, an ESD gun basically is a, um, it's a charged element that descends down, shocks whatever it comes in contact with, and then retracts. The idea is you have live equipment that you've got open to air, and you're grounded, and it's a very, very, very much a, uh, you know, safe, clean lab environment, and you record what you do, and you follow along, you look at the uh, output and log files and try to determine at what point does the system not respond anymore or does it take longer over a particular period of time. This was getting into mathematics and physics that I really didn't have a background in. And I thought to myself, well, I'll pick it up. I'll learn it. I'll do what I can. But actually that wasn't quite the case. I came to a frustrating conclusion about a year in that as we were stepping up into more EVT type work and looking at more areas of you know, heat and freezing and other, that this was really not something I'd prepared for or that I knew a lot about. And I hoped that I would just kind of pick it up over time and I realized, and to be quite frank, uh, the director of product management who I reported to realized that I really didn't have that skill set. You know when you draw when you come into a manager's office and they start out the conversation with, I've been looking at your resume, dot dot dot. This is not going to be a conversation that's going to go well. And it was not a conversation that went well. And to be quite honest, it was a conversation that didn't go well, rightfully so. Based on what I knew based on what I'd been able to learn and based on what the expectation was. I will flat out say for that period of time, I did not live up to it. I didn't have it and I struggled. And the biggest mistake I made then was that I didn't want to show my ignorance. I didn't want to admit, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what I'm doing. Because I couldn't say, I don't know what I'm doing, I faked it. I tried my best to fit in and slink around areas and do what I had to do. And in a way, and I, I, I'm going to be, you know, this is where it starts to get a little embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I was intellectually dishonest with myself. And in a way, I was intellectually dishonest with my coworkers. And so, yeah, I, we had to basically come to a arrangement that I would no longer work there. That that hit me hard. It was painful. It was a very, you know, gut-wrenching experience. And it was now the second time that I'd been laid off in just a, about a year and three months' time. And I was feeling very frustrated. And I was looking at the job market and options. And I was not feeling all that optimistic. Uh, when a QA engineer needs to have six years of programming experience in J2EE, when J2EE hadn't even been out for six years, you know, there's, there's something weird going on in the market. I just, I couldn't live up to the laundry list at that point in time. And also the biggest factor was now where for many years, nobody cared if I had a, had a degree. Now I was finding that it was really difficult to even get a callback, even from a recruiter, 
if I didn't have her degree. And I made a choice at that point in time. And that choice was, I said, well, I'm actually, I, I, I have, I have a lot, you know, a nest egg that we, I've saved up for many years. And if I had to go a period of time where I didn't have the opportunity of getting work, what would I do? And my dad actually, you know, came back to me and said, hey, why don't you go back to school? You can weather this. Maybe this is a good time to do that. And so I did. And I went back and I decided, well, I've been doing testing for all this time. What is our testing degree? No, not in the United States, there's not. Uh, computer science, oh, I don't know. There's a lot there that I don't quite, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of stuff I'd have to do that I just didn't think I was going to do. But they had degrees in information systems and technology. Well, well, okay, that kind of fits into the reality of what I'm doing. And so I decided to go that route and focus on an IT-based degree. And I believe me, I was very motivated. I wanted to get it done as fast as possible and I wanted to do it as well as I possibly could. And I dove into it. And this was a distance learning program. Uh, I did it all, basically everything was done in online classes. And that was a really interesting experience because in an online class, you have a way of communicating. It's asynchronous. It doesn't have that immediate, you're sitting in a room and listening to somebody lecture at you and you just sit there because of the fact that you have to respond and you have to read and you have to write and synthesize what you're learning, I felt I learned more in that environment than I did at any given time that I was working, say, in a standard classroom. And that was really quite liberating. I thought, wow, this is a different approach. This is a different model. It was about 2003, so online education was still fairly early. You know, we've made huge leaps and bounds since then, but that was a huge impact on me. And I found that that was very helpful to be able to use a different learning model and work with it. And whereas in live classes I did, eh, did either okay to middling to poor, here I was able to do very well because after so many years of writing and Usenet groups and interacting in that manner, I was very well prepared to work with an online environment for school more so than many of the other you know, students were, more so than many of the teachers were, which was kind of interesting. And so I had that background, I had that ability, and I went through it rapidly. And because I went through it, I finished it in two years. And because I was able to finish it in two years, by the time I got out, I had a chance to say, well, what do I wanna do? Where do I wanna go now? I'm kind of starting over again, you know, clock's set, I'm starting it again. And this time, as I was looking at job descriptions, I was disheartened, again, to see that most of the QA stuff was expecting me to be some, you know, super high-level programmer. But I thought, well, you know what? After having worked with the uh, support groups in Connectix and a bit of Synaptics, what would it be like to work with them? And so I went and I worked in their environment. And that was really eye-opening. What was really eye-opening about that was the fact that they had a lot, they were doing a lot of the stuff that I was doing as a tester, but they were doing it in a much more rapid environment. They were doing it in a sort of do or die uh, manner. You know, somebody's on the phone, they're about to jump and you know, they're really freaking out and okay, you gotta calm you down, let's figure this out, we can make this work. And so that's what I decided to do. One of the things that I glossed over, and I probably should mention at this point actually, is when it came to when I was working with when I was going to school and I was focusing on getting through school, one of the things that popped into my inbox as I was coming Craigslist looking for things that would fit, I saw an interesting job application. It said QA professional, you know, detail, you know, all the stuff that we're used to seeing. Excellent singing voice, a major plus. What is that all about? Well, so I had to reply. So I said, well, if you're looking for a QA professional, I've been doing it for 10 years, worked for Cisco, worked for Connectix, worked for Synaptics. Here's the stuff that I've done. Uh, excellent singing voice. Well, I don't know if I've got an excellent singing voice, but I was a professional singer for 10 years and I have the CD to prove it. So here's the link to the CD. Here's the link to who I am as what I do work-wise. Let me know what you're up to. Sounds interesting. They contacted me, by the way. That in, in, that excellent singing voice, a major plus, was coming from Konami Digital Entertainment. So you might be familiar with Konami. Konami makes a number of 
pretty famous games. They're the ones that make Castlevania, they make Metal Gear Solid, they make Silent Hill, they make uh, Dance Dance Revolution. And also, they were looking to partner with a company in Boston called Harmonix and bring out a game called Karaoke Revolution. And what they wanted was somebody who could sing at an expert level. They had lots of testers, but they didn't have people who were able to sing at a level that would be calibrated for an expert for the game. So they needed somebody who could sing. And that's where that interesting job application came from. And I said, sure, okay, I'm okay, game, let's give it a try. And so that's what I did. I went in and I worked with them for that particular gig. And as I was focusing on it and as I was working with it, I found it to be an interesting environment. Um, not an environment that I would grow to become a fan of over time. For those of you who are not familiar with what game testing is or was like 10 years ago, uh, I can't speak for today. I, the market probably has changed considerably. This is when the PS2 and the Xbox were the dominant consoles and the Nintendo GameCube was out and the Game Boy Advance had just kind of come on the market. And uh, basically, this is a market where most everybody was contract. Everybody came in for about the same pay rate, which was not very much. And everybody had a similar kind of contract, which meant you were hired for a few months. And when the work, you know, and you were often expected to work pretty insane hours. And when the work dried up, you were laid off. And very often when you were laid off, you were laid off with a stipulation that you couldn't work there again for 90 days. So most game testers were nomadic, which meant that they were frequently hooking up different contracts with different companies so that when a contract would end, they'd have something to jump into right after that fact. So the tricky part was, was that no seniority was ever really built. And so a lot of these people went from job to job. You know, they had experience, and they had, uh, had background, but they didn't have enough time with a particular company to very often get hired on full-time. And the full-time jobs were very, very slim. There, there were only a handful of people working full-time at, at, at any of these places. I'm not saying that to disparage anybody. I'm just saying that that's the fact. And that's how it worked in that particular market. More to the point also, though, was that I really found that I had to talk to people who were really excited. Wow, you're working for Konami. You're a game tester. How cool is that? Honestly, not very cool at all. There's a big difference between playing a game and testing a game. Playing a game means that you basically walk the game and you, you know, you're entertained by it and you look at things and you play the game on its rails. You don't play a game on its rails when you're a tester. As a matter of fact, as a tester, the most common thing that I found myself doing, if it was an active play game where I had an actual character that I was controlling, I spent a lot of my time taking that character and maneuvering them toward walls and scraping the character along the walls or climbing up into stairwells and moving them around and doing a lot of basic physics. Do I fall through the cracks? Yeah, I did a lot of that. Um, there was also uh, this thing called the technical, technical resource checklist, TRC. TRC is a famous uh, phrase in the uh, console world. Uh, any title that doesn't pass you know, the TRC doesn't get released. And it's very specific. And you just got to do it. And you got to roll through it. And you do it every single time a game gets released. And also, very many, of the you know, much of the time you had to really get into a system where you were focusing on whichever title you were working on. And what was important in one game wasn't necessarily important in another. And a level of quality for a small platform, independent publish, uh, you know, they might let certain things go. For a flagship product, though, no. They really, really went, you know, all out. And they wanted to make sure that it was as good as it could possibly be. And they would throw everybody at it. And, you know, you learned a lot from that. You learned that... You know, game testing, it's not all fun and games. It just isn't. It's a hard, hard environment. And people who are willing to stay with it long term, it's, you know, my hat's off to them. It's a really, it's a really challenging environment to want to stick with. I don't know how many game testers, in fact, from the ones I do know that I interacted with at that time, 
Most of them today are not in QA. They do other things now. They're either designers or programmers or something having to do with the game market that's not involving testing. Myself and two others, two others that I remember working with are at this point in time still actively involved in software testing. So it's not a huge number. They, they use it, they use the testing as what they hope will be a springboard into something else. Game testing falls into kind of the same, you know, the game industry basically falls into the same type of weird reality that the music industry falls into. Everybody wants a piece of it. They want to be in on it. And so they can hire whoever they feel like and they don't have to pay them very much and they can do an awful lot to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say run them in the ground. Lully, please edit that. I don't want to say that it is, I mean, it, just, it takes a certain personality to want to survive in the game industry. And after two years of it, I decided that I had had enough. And frankly, I had had enough to the point to where I was really not all that enthusiastic about doing another testing job. I thought, I need to get out of this. I, I, I think I'm burnt out on QA. I'm burnt out on QA. And interestingly enough, because I was also splitting my time as a customer support rep, and I was getting very good you know, remarks and props from people for doing that, I decided to look into what it would take to be a support rep for a company. And that's actually when I made my jump. When I left school, I didn't go to do a job to be a, a, a tester. I went to do my job as a support representative. And for a period of about six months, that's all I did. But as you can probably guess, over time, when it came known that I had a pretty extensive software testing background, more and more of my time got put onto actually doing testing and helping the developers. And then within about 18 months, two years of my working at this most recent job, which is with a company called Tracker Corp, I was back in QA full time. I was doing software testing again. So one of the things I want to bring up from this, and let me mention this, this is Okay, picking up again. One of the interesting things I will take back from the time that I was working with uh, Konami was the fact that because they were a Japanese company, I had a lot of my communication that had to go back to Japan. And because it had to go back to Japan, that meant it had to be translated to Japanese. And this was before you know, Google Translate or anything even like it was around. That meant that somebody physically had to look at every bug report, had to look at every report, every status update, and they had to translate it to Japanese every single day. And that was how we ended our day. We had to make sure that the lead tester would look at our stuff and say, that can be translated, that can be translated, that doesn't make sense, I'd like you to reword that. And I had to go through this every single day. Uh, so I got to the point to where I, I understood what they were after and I was able to meet that requirement, which was fine. But it helped me in a way because I, I learned how to be very precise with my language, especially when it came to reporting bugs. And because I could be very precise with reporting language, I was able to say, okay, I'm going to take the time now to make sure that I understand what's going on here, that uh, I am not being ambiguous, that I really can make known to somebody who English is either not only not a second language or they don't even speak it, that they understand what I'm talking about. And that was a really good learning experience for me to go through. And I <laughs> believe me, if nothing else, I recommend if you get a chance to work for a company that has a development team in another country and doesn't speak English, you will really learn um, how, to, how to parse the language in a way you are not used to, me personally was not used to. And I found that very valuable. Um, you know, and interestingly enough in games, it's sometimes it's the little things that drive people crazy. Everybody seems to think that it's the big catastrophic bugs. Like, you know, you fall through the floor and, oh, my character's stuck. And you think that people would, I, that's not acceptable. I can't deal with that. No, actually, that's not so bad. In fact, usually we laugh about it. Oh, look, I fell through the floor. <laughs> Hold on. Jump me out. Get back on the platform. Okay, I know where the hole is. And we just move on. It's no big deal. It's little things. 
And what really is the frustrating part, especially for people who play games, it's the accumulation of little things. Over time, it gets very frustrating and it gets very annoying as they build up and they build up and build up. And suddenly they say, this game sucks. Or this is not a quality game. It doesn't have big problems, but it's got lots of little ones. And as they accumulate, that sets, that sets the tone. It just does. So again, you never really know what's going to set somebody off. But um, it does help to take a look. If you start to see a lot of little bugs coming together, try to accumulate them and, and, and approach them as a group, if you can, and say, hey, this is something we really need to take a look at. By the time I started working at Tracker, which is the job that I did right after I got finished with school, when I decided that I had enough of game testing, I decided, you know, I was going to focus on doing tech support for a while. But actually, that lasted me about six months, and then it came to be a slow transition back to me being a software tester full-time. And once I became a software tester full-time, well, okay, then I guess that's it. It's my lot in life, and I'm going to go with it. Fine. And I did so for about another, you know, couple of years. In fact, I was at Tracker almost for four and a half years. And something happened while I was there for that four and a half years. Part of me just kind of went on autopilot. Actually, no, I'll be very frank. A lot of me went on autopilot. I just stopped learning. I knew enough of what to do. I just did what I had to and each time that we got a new form that had to be checked, I would do it. And each time that we had some new release, I'd walk through the steps. And I knew exactly what I had to do. And, you know, I just, it was rote. It was like doing math problems at that point. I just did them. And that started to be very bothersome to me. And frankly, it became tedious. And when it becomes tedious, you start looking for other avenues to do different things. And you start, you know, wasting time, frankly. You start looking at ways that you can alleviate the boredom. You just get out of your groove and you stop being effective. And that's what happened to me. And it really was a wake-up call for me when my director, actually who was vice president of engineering at that point in time, this was a guy I'd worked with for five years and we spent time in the same room, had a lot of the same interests, a lot of the same realities, and we were roughly the same age too. And it was very humbling, saddening, frustrating, you know, humiliating to actually be told, dude, you need to do something about whatever it is that's your problem. Because if you don't fix it, you're going to have to find someplace else to work. Now, after five years of working at a company, that's not something you want to hear. And I didn't want to hear it. And it woke me up. It made me say, wait a minute. So I've been a, te I've been a tester now for 17, 18 years. And I just kind of did my gig. You know, I knew what to do and I felt like I could do a good job with it. But at some point, something happened, and it just became rote. And when it became rote, I stopped improving. Everything else that I had done in my life that had been something that I was passionate about, where I was able to improve, it was because I had that obsessiveness, that ADHD kind of, oh my gosh, I must learn everything there is about this. And I did that when it came to just about every passion in my life. When it came to music, when it came to my things that I did when I was a kid, when it came to snowboarding, you know, I, I loved it so much that I went out to compete amateurly, but still I did compete. Um, I loved my involvement in the scouting organization. I've spent 20 years as an adult leader, not just because I wanted my son to become an Eagle Scout. I did it before I even had kids. And I still do it because it matters to me immensely. And I got to a point where I had to say, why do those parts of my life fill me with passion and I'm excited about them and I dive into them with everything. But testing doesn't. What is it about testing? What am I missing? And I realized that I was missing a few things. Part of it was I'd stopped improving. I'd stopped looking for interesting challenges. I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. 
I was bored. Plain and simple, I was bored. But what can you do about that? How do you fix being bored? Well, I decided for myself, I said, I need to find something a little different. What can I do to jumpstart that spark? What can I do to make it exciting again? And I had some, you know, there was a number of things that I did. I looked in a lot of different areas. I looked, at, I looked through books. I looked through my old, you know, collection of books that I had for years. You know, Ken Kaner, you know, Kaner Falk Nguyen's uh, Testing Computer Software was a title that I'd looked through. And I said, oh, okay, you know. Uh, all right. It just didn't jump out at me as something that, okay, I'm already doing a lot of this. And as I was going through and looking at some other avenues, I came across, I came across a podcast. And the podcast was from a guy with the name of Merlin Mann. Merlin Mann is fairly well known for a number of projects. At the time that I was listening to him, though, he was most known for a site called 43 Folders. And it was about doing the work that matters to you. And it was through Merlin Mann that I came across, well, it wasn't just through Merlin Mann, but it was also through, um, it was through looking online as well. I, I came across two books. And these two books are faithful. The first one is James Bach's Secrets of a Buccaneer Scholar. And I read that cover to cover and I had a major epiphany while reading that book. And the simple fact was, was oh my gosh, my involvement with the school system and my involvement with how I learn and how weird my brain is and what influences me and what doesn't influence me and what's effective and what's not effective. I'm not alone. James had many of the same experiences that I did. He approaches them from a different avenue, but it was really interesting to read that. And I read it several times and thought, wow, there is something to this. But it was through Merlin Mann and an interview that he had uh, done with Seth Godin. And Seth Godin had just released a book called Lynchpin. And in Lynchpin, Seth makes a very daring suggestion. And that suggestion is, what if you had to live your life without a resume? What if you could not throw a piece of paper at somebody and say, Here, here's who I am. I'd like a job. Here's who I am. What if that wasn't open to you? What would you do? How would you go about letting people know what you were and what you could do? And he had some very interesting ideas in that. And one of the very interesting ideas, he said, you know, he spelled them out. He said, have five thought leaders in your field write letters of recommendation on your behalf. Have a product that you could point people to, a website or you know, something, mobile app, whatever but something that people could point to, poke at, and play around with and go, hey, this is really neat. Have a GitHub account. Let people see your code, if that's what you're doing. Get involved in some local group and become a major presence in that group. Write a blog that is so compelling that people cannot, people cannot ignore it. They have to stand up and take notice. And the point that he made with this, and it was, you know, just bam, it hit me really hard when he said, I know what a lot of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, yeah, that would be great, but I don't have any of those things. Yeah, that's exactly the point. If you don't have any of those things, what makes you think that you are special, interesting, unique, talented, a step above everybody else? Well, I had to stop and think about those for a second. Hmm, I don't have... Thought leader is going to be a little challenging. I'm not really a coder. Don't have a product that I can share. But I can write. And the blog seems like an interesting idea. And that's, frankly, because of the way that I learned and realizing that I wasn't alone. And the idea of bringing actual art into the work that you do, whatever it is you do, was the impetus that made me decide that I wanted to write about software testing. And that's how TestHead was born. TestHead was born March 10th, 2010. In a lot of ways, I consider that day very important because that's when I started a ball rolling down the hill 
you want to think of like a snowball, roll it down the hill and it just keeps picking up snow and gets larger and larger and larger. That's when it all started. When I launched Test Head, much of my life and thought process around software testing dramatically changed. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next little clip. If I had to go back to March or just before March of 2010, just before I launched Test Head, and if I wanted to do some, talk to myself back then and say, what is it that you need? What are you missing? I think I've got the answer to that now. And I really want to share it here because I think for those of us who are side door entries, this probably matters to us more than it matters to just about anybody else. What I ultimately got out of getting to that point was the fact that I was waiting for somebody to give me the key. I was waiting for someone, something, you know, that here's that key piece of information. If I could just get that key piece of information, then I can be awesome. Then I can be amazing. And that was flawed. I should never have fallen into that because I knew better. I knew better because I had years of not following the rules to begin with. Again, I was in a career that for all practical purposes, I should have never been part of. It was not part of my game plan. I didn't wait for someone to show me the way. I took a ball and I ran with it. And that's what I realized I was missing. I'd lost sight of that, what it meant to just take the ball and run. Not try to look for a map because for what I wanted to do, there really wasn't one. Not where I was, not as a lone tester in a small company. There wasn't anybody that was going to show me the way. So I had to figure it out myself. And that's where my blog starts to come in. And that's where Test Head, in a lot of ways, kind of saved, saved my sanity. When I started Test Head, I tried being that authoritative blogger, just like so many others. Oh, I'm a tester and I know so much and I've been in this industry for 20 years. Let's sit down, let's sit down and let me tell you all the wisdom and you know, knowledge I've learned. That lasted about a month. And I started looking at the posts that I made. And if you go back to my blog and you look at my first couple of, you know, my first few weeks of entries, that's exactly what they look like. They look like they're authoritative, like I'm speaking to somebody from a professor level. And I have to say, I owe a big debt of gratitude to Matt Heuser because Matt was one of the first people when I launched my blog and I said, hey, I got a new blog, I'm doing this. And I like to, because I knew Matt from you know, Software Test and Performance, which became Software Test and Quality Assurance, Software Test Professionals. Uh, he was, he'd written for them for quite some time and I just, I liked the fact that he was actively writing. I said, hey, I started this blog and I know who you are and I, familiar with the work that you do. And he came and commented on it. He says, you know, you've got some, you know, you, you've got some good experience. You've got some things, you know, if you want to do more with this, if you want to do more writing, if you want to get involved with conferences and actively speaking, you might want to consider it. You've got something to say. That was huge. That was a really tremendously valuable piece of information for me because somebody who'd already experienced a level of success in the in, in the testing industry, the one that I was in, was actually saying, no, dude, don't, don't, don't freak out, man. You actually have something to, to offer, which was great and very cool. Shortly after that, I saw a post on Twitter and somebody had written a blog and somebody had written some comments about a interestingly named school of software testing. Uh, the Miyagi-Do School of Software Testing, in fact. <laughs> I chuckled when I saw it because I thought, Miyagi-Do, wait a minute, that's uh, Pat Morita's character from the, karate, for, from the Karate Kid. Yeah, that was kind of the point. And having seen that and seen what they were talking about and what it was that they were doing, it interested me because there was a level of, hey, I'm not going to find anybody in my organization that's going to help me become a better tester. So why don't I start looking outside of my organization? I didn't really know anybody local except for the people that I'd worked with who followed many of the same tips and things that I did. So I didn't think I was going to get anything new from them. 
Nothing against my friends in the Bay Area, you know, who, who are testers. You do great, you know, you do great work. It's just for what I was looking for at that point in time, I would have just been, oh yeah, you know, been there, done that. I wanted to do something kind of dramatically different. And that's how I fell under the spell of the Miyagi-Do School of Software Testing and became a student and began working through challenges and getting involved and being asked to step out of my comfort zone and do things that I normally wouldn't have done on my own or felt that I had the courage to do on my own. The first steps that started from that was, hey, how, how would you like to help us review a book? And I thought, sure, I can do that. Okay. And about a month into after reviewing a couple of chapters of the book, it was, hey, one of our authors dropped off. How would you like to write a chapter for the book? Oh. Okay. I could do that. And so I did. And I presented a chapter. And Matt's first comments when I wrote, wrote it up, because I wrote it up like a classic term paper, very professorial voice, and he said, voice. And he said, Michael, I've been up late. I haven't had a lot of sleep. If this comes off blunt or gruff, please forgive me. Uh, it's not meant to be, but I'm going to address this straightforward as I can. The professorial voice, the professorial voice, lose it. Don't use it. Just please don't. Talk from your own experience. Talk from what you know, what you've done or what you haven't done. Talk from, not statistics show, but I did this, and I saw this, or I saw that. That's much more interesting to people. He also said something that was very profound to me, and very prophetic. He said, you know what, if you really are serious about blogging, you might want to, instead of trying to convince everybody that you know a lot, you might want to explore some of the avenues that you don't know so much about and just put it out there and tell people, hey, I'm ignorant on this given area. And at first that terrified me. I thought, are you kidding me? I can't do that. But then I stopped and I thought, I said, wait, why shouldn't I? What's it going to hurt? The worst is going to happen is someone's going to laugh at me because, oh, ha, ha, he doesn't know how to program with selenium. Okay, so, and where do we go from here? Are you going to help me? Do you have tips where I can go? Or what? It's the worst that can happen. Someone can laugh. And to date, no one has. Unless I've encouraged it. And that was powerful. Again, because by putting out what I didn't know, I was differentiating from everybody else. I was owning up to what I could understand. And very often the things that I was frustrated about are like, I don't get this. This doesn't make any sense. What am I missing here? Others would write back and say, you're not alone, man. That's hard stuff. And we're struggling with it. And I realized that much of what we do in software testing, we've just been doing it because we've been told to do it. We didn't look for a different way. We didn't look for another avenue to help us explore a different approach. And I decided I had to just say, stop. Let's look, let's think differently. And for starters, let me admit that I don't know a lot. And when I started doing that and people started communicating with me and I started writing off of that communication and it started to snowball and I started to get more responses and I started to get more people reading my blog and more people sending me emails and offering me other suggestions of avenues to look at, books to read, people to talk to, uh, meetups to go attend. That started a, for me, just a great groundswell of enthusiasm. And I was really pumped about software testing and that obsessive ADHD, oh, oh, you know, just dive in and grab and dig it for all it's worth. It came. And I had that. And I went, oh, yes. This is what I've been after. This is what I want to be able to do. And it's been really very cool because with that enthusiasm, with that motivation, opportunities have come my way. And I've been able to say, yes, I want to get involved, involved in that. 
by writing the chapter for the book for how to decrease the so how to reduce the cost of software testing. I got offers to write more articles in other places, um, places that actually paid me to write articles. So I thought, wow, that's cool. Okay. And when you start doing that, that gives you more avenues to consider. That gives you more areas to explore. Something interesting when it comes to blog posts, by the way, I'll just make this quick. The more you write, the more blog posts you're going to be able to write. The less you write, the harder it is to create the ones that you actually do get around to doing. It's counterintuitive, but it's, for me personally, it's true. The more that I think, the more that I write, the more active I am when I get into that, the better it comes across. The more frequently that I write, the more frequently that I approach any of the topics I do, the more I find I have the capacity to write. The more I dig into testing, the more that I get into all of the nitty gritty details, the more excited I become. And that's a real big tool that I would encourage anybody. If you're frustrated, if you're stuck, if you're not progressing, the answer is to dive in with everything you've got and let people know that you're doing it. It really makes a tremendous difference. As I kept getting more and more involved, as more and more opportunities kept coming my way, I started to see a trend. And the trend was that each time that I got more and more involved in something else, each time that I got another, every single time that I stepped up to the plate to take on something, I thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm not uh, able to do that. Something really cool happened because of it. By going into Miyagi-Do, for example, I was challenged to look for some different ways to expand the way that I was thinking. I was introduced to AST because of that. I was introduced to AST specifically so I could check out the black box software testing classes. I took that class, the first class, the foundations class, and it reminded me so much of my uh, distance learning stuff I did for college. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I can do this right on. Yes, this seems so very familiar. And I said, you know, hey, I have a lot of familiarity with this kind of a format and this kind of an environment. I did it for two years. Um, do you need help teaching these classes? How would I go about doing that? And it didn't take very long to be offered, hey, if you want to teach, we'd love to have you. So come on. And so I started teaching the classes. And after I started teaching the classes, that gave me a whole nother level of insight because I started to interact with testers from different spheres and different industries things I'd never touched before. And it started to open up to me that, yeah, you know, there is a lot of similarity, but there's a lot of difference in what we do. And so the quest to find just that one thing, or say, if I just learned this, then I'd be a great tester. I now don't believe that's true. I don't believe it's possible to do that. I think what happens is there's an entire, you know, ecosystem of software and contexts and methods and ways to test. And we need to learn them as we come in contact with them, basically. It's like saying, I'm gonna sit down and learn all of the world's languages at one go. Why? Unless you're going to actively go out and speak with those people that speak those languages, it's not going to be worth anything because you're not gonna have the context to actually use it. And that was something that was very valuable. I started to really consider context when it came to testing. For me, it's not just saying, oh, I'm a, you know, I, you know, I believe in the context-driven school of software testing. No, it really does come down to the fact that your context greatly impacts and influences the way and the methods that you use when you test. And I found that to be kind of a really cool revelation. But the more that I got involved and the more things that I did, the more actively engaged I became. And I found that I was able to take on more opportunities. I was introduced to weekend testing, specifically through the European site and Marcus Gartner and Anna Bike. And by doing those sessions and getting involved with them and learning about them, it helped me step up and say, 
I like this model. I think this is a great way for people to learn and practice software testing. I want to bring this to the United States. But again, I was waiting for somebody else to do it. I was waiting for somebody else to actually step up and make it happen. And I even wrote a blog post about why hasn't weekend testing come to the Americas. And I want to actually say that somebody very astutely called me out on that and said, well, maybe it's because nobody felt it was valuable enough to bring to America. I notice you haven't stepped up and volunteered to do it. Yeah, and that was true. I hadn't. But that gave me all the motivation I needed to say, okay, then I think it's time that we brought it here. And once I said I was willing to do it, other people jumped on and said, hey, that would be really cool. I'd like to see that happen too. I'll help you get it off the ground. And we did. And all of these things were happening and all of these things were cascading. In addition, we also, I was also contacted again by Matt to say, hey, you know, I'm working on a podcast for software test professionals, but it's getting away from me. And I need some help with this, you know, maybe some editing, maybe some, you know, maybe making it so that it sounds good. I, I just don't have the time to do it all myself. And I thought, hey, this works right up my alley. This is kind of just like music production. And so I said, yes, I'll do it. Yes, I will. And I jumped in and started producing and I produced something in the neighborhood of 125 podcasts over the next two and a half years. And was invited to actually speak in a number of those podcasts and share my views and some of the things that I'd been involved in. So what was happening was that as I started, remember back to that whole Seth Godin thing I was talking about before about, you know, have a body of work. If you didn't have a resume, what could people look at? And I realized that I was starting to get a lot of embeddable content that discussed what I knew or discussed what I believed or my general approach to things. And it was that approach that started getting people's attention. A friend of mine even contacted me and said, hey, we're looking to find a software tester to work at our company. I Sounds like from what you're doing, you probably wouldn't be interested in it, but could you help give us some pointers? And that started a conversation that led to another conversation that led to me meeting a couple of the founders of this particular company and ultimately being hired by them. And it was a really amazing turn of events. And that turn of events came about because I was willing to put myself out there and get enthusiastic about what it is that I was doing and show the world that I was enthusiastic about it. Again, I didn't have some tremendous credential that I could display for everybody to see. I had completed the BBST Foundation's you know, software testing class, that certificate that came with it. Certificate, not certification, certificate. Just to show that I finished the class. That's, that was all I had at that point to show that I had any formal testing training ever. And it was just interesting to see that because I wasn't looking for a formal way of being taught, but I was trying to learn as much as I could from as many people as I could that became infectious and people started to take notice and that's how I was able to land another to land the job that I did over at Sidereel and step into the agile phase of my career because this is the first time I've ever worked for a agile company more on that as I said I was going to go into my agile phase of my testing life and that really just started about three years ago and that started about the beginning of 2011 so here we are almost at the end of 2013. So that gives you a good example of what's transpired since then. Uh, in that period of time, I've had a chance to work with two really great companies and have two very different experiences uh, th from working within those agile environments. Uh, in one of the companies, I was a lone tester. When I went to SideReel, that was the purpose of them hiring me, was to be the lone tester on their team and to embed myself in an agile team. And that was a very interesting process. I learned a great deal. I stepped out of my comfort zones again. Uh, I actually dug in and learned a bit about software test automation in a way that I'd never done before because that was their forte. That was something that they could teach me. In return, I offered to teach them a bit more about exploratory testing and how to go in and look at things from a different perspective. 
than just from automated tests and a unit test background. And that was actually very helpful. Um, it showed me a lot of areas that I could improve. It showed me areas that I was uncomfortable about. But the cool thing was I was working with a great team of engineers that was willing to give me the time of day and help me out with it and figure out what I needed to do. Uh, I had a great experience early on in the process because the question was, we'd like to, one of the things they said was, we'd like to have kind of a black box crossover have somebody who could uh, run our tests from the front end from what our customers would see and not necessarily have a lot of deep knowledge of the code. Their idea was they wanted to give me an automation project to work with so that I could uh, dig into it and apply it and build on it and make it much more like some of the stuff they were doing. I thought, okay, that's interesting, but hmm, I'm not sure that I you know how to get the, knew how to get that started. And one of the, one of the programmers actually said to me, he says, I'll get you started. I'll help you out. You know, we'll, we'll take the month of, you know, we'll, this, this upcoming month, basically, uh, I, I'd like, can you come in at seven o'clock in the morning? If so, we'll pair for an hour each day and we'll get this environment up and running. I thought, wow, you're willing to come in at seven o'clock? Sure, I can do that. And so I did. So for a month, I got a chance to pair and help get this environment together and learn how it was constructed and built and get a feel for what it took to actually maintain this and get a good glimpse as to the way that the developers looked at what they did for their testing. And it gave me a chance to play navigator and ask questions and show them from my perspective what I thought the testing was. And it made for a very interesting dynamic. I learned their techniques and they learned some of mine. Ultimately though, and I'm not gonna say this to be, be a downer, I got to a point after so many years where I just said, I am so just kind of run down being a lone tester. I had done it all by myself for so many years and it just started feeling lonely. I'd gotten the sense of community. I'd gotten the sense of, hey, there's these people out here. There are these individuals that saw that test and they're into it. And I'm part of this community and it's great. I'd like to have that, I'd like to have that interaction every day. How can I do that? And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do that if I was still going to be working all by myself in this regard. And so I put out a, I put out a, 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 I put out a query and I said, I've been a lone gun for a long time. I'd like a chance to try working with a team again, whether it's to build a team or be part of an existing one. I'm open to suggestions. And I was fortunate in the sense that somebody who had already known my work who had watched, who had listened to my podcasts, who'd been to conferences that I'd spoken at, who'd been to meetups where I've been the speaker or have, and has read my, had read my blog for quite some time and also knew one, uh, a number of my uh, software testing compatriots contacted me and said, if you're, if you're looking, I'm interested, let's talk. And he brought me into social text, which is where I'm at right now. And that has been a cool experience in the sense that what I've been able to do is meld a lot of what I've learned over the past 20 years and work with a team so that we can all share our experiences. We don't all have to rely on our own strength. Now, it's one of the tricky things when you have a team is that it's very comforting when things get hectic, you go to where you feel safe. And when you're a soul, you know, when, you, when you're a lone tester, when you're a lone gun, there is no safe space. There's no, there's no place that is safe. You have to give it your all. You have to talk with a lot of people and cover a lot of ground. And if it's needed, it's just plain needed. And even if you don't really know what you're doing, you got to figure it out. When you work with a team, there are going to be specialties. And people are going to have expertise and they're going to have background. And the best opportunity there is to let those expertise, let the best opportunity there is to let those people with those special expertise share that with you. And you share your special expertise with them. Because that way you prevent silos from building. And when you can prevent silos from building, I know it sounds counterintuitive. You're thinking, wait a minute, if I tell 
all my coworkers what I know how to do and they can do equally well what I can do, why do they need me? No, it's kind of, it sounds like that would be the case, but it has been my experience that the more you give away, the more of your knowledge that you share with others, and the more of your ignorance that you share with others, yes, I'm coming back to that, the better position you're in because they understand what you can do, they understand what you may not feel comfortable doing, they also understand what you could learn how to do. And if it gets to the point that everybody on your team shares the same knowledge, you will actually see that it's not that, oh, we're all equally dispensable. In fact, you're all equally valuable at a high rate because now you can actually accomplish more. You can actually do things as a team that one of you alone might not be able to do. And you can start picking up other avenues that you've never even had a chance to touch, which lets more specialties come and go. And then you can pool together again. And again, don't make silos. Share what you know. Share with the people that are on your team. It's really, really important. I've been talking a long time. There's a lot more I could say. But the point of this talk and the title of the talk again was In Through the Side Door. And it is how can we specifically as software testers, but this can go way beyond that. How can we become really incredible at what we do, even if we don't come from the traditionally, even if we don't come from the traditional places where we expect to find incredible? A couple of thoughts, and again, I'm gonna leverage a little bit from my test head blog, and then I'm gonna close this and say thank you so very much for uh, having me speak with you today. Inspiration comes from many places. I can't pinpoint just one person and say, hey, this person was the one that, you know, lit the fuse. Very often you will find that you need a whole framework of things to happen. You'll need a lot of experiences to come to bear, but once you do, those experiences are gonna be tremendous. And when you combine them, you're gonna have a chemical reaction that's gonna cause an explosion in a good way. Every single person is a brand unto themselves. I know that sounds really like, you know, oh my gosh, it's, it's creepy. You know, it's, like, it's like human resources. I'm not a resource, neither are you. You're a person. You're a person with tremendous value, with your own passions, your own ideals, and your, your own aspirations. And you need to explore them, and you need to decide which ones matter to you. But that, you are your own brand, and you are the only one who can sell that brand. So when you come in through the side door, what you're basically saying is, I'm not going to be normal. I'm not going to be typical. I'm not going to follow the map. It's not why I'm here. I want to make my own map. And I want my map to be different than everybody else's. And if you can do that successfully, that's huge. I write a blog and I find it to be one of the most valuable things that I have now. And the reason why it's the most valuable thing that I have is that it is an open portal. People are free to come in. They can take my ideas. They can try them out for themselves. They can see if they work. They can see if they're a waste of time. But the benefit is it's there. They can look it over. They can consider them. They can share them with others. And what happens is people come back and they want to read more of what you have to write or what you have to say. Because I don't care if someone decides to write a curl script that goes and downloads every single page of my blog and calls out everything and pattern matches it and decides they want to claim it as their own. 
hey, whatever. That's, that's their choice if they choose to do that. My blog isn't the individual articles. It isn't the posts. It's the years of experience, frustrations, ups and downs, completely aggravating and exciting experiences that help make it what it is. The blog is not the writing. The blog is me. It's my institutional memory of where I've been and where I want to go. To this day, whenever anybody asks me, hey, would you be interested in coming to work for us? My answer to them is not, uh, well, hey, you know, tell me what to do. It's go read my blog. I want you to go read what I've written. I want you to read what, where my headspace is. I want you to read what I value and what I feel I can bring to any team. If you read 10 of my blog posts and still want to have a conversation with me, fantastic. Let's have that conversation. If after reading 10 of my blog posts, you've decided you know enough about me and you don't want to continue a conversation, that's fine too. Because now you know. You know who I am. You know what my ideas are and how I like to present them and what I really care about and what I believe in. And I would hope that that would be important to anybody to be able to share that. Is a blog the way to go? Maybe not. You know, maybe, maybe it's an active Twitter account. Maybe it's a podcast. Maybe it's a GitHub account that shows some project you're working on. Maybe it's a LeanPub book that you've been working on on a particular topic. Whatever it is, make it yours. Put yourself into it. And give as much of yourself as you can to the world around you. Give away as much as you can. Don't be stupid about it. I'm not saying give away everything so that, you ne so that nobody has any reason to ever need to hire you. But give away more than you think you should. There's a real strong value to that. And I'm totally stealing this from Merlin Mann and John Gruber's uh, talk at South by South. West in 2009, 2008, excuse me. There's, there's a huge value in letting people know what you can do and letting people know what you'd be willing to do for free. And because you're willing to do them for free, that also gives them a good indication of, uh, yeah, how, how focused and how dedicated you might be if they were actually paying you. And the, most, and the final piece here, and the one that I want to make sure that everybody kind of takes away from this, is we're not born with ideas. You know, the phrase I love is we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, I haven't developed a great idea or invented the next great thing in software testing. And you know what? I don't know if I ever will. But that's okay. I don't have to be the one that invents the next great thing. I don't have to measure myself by that. And neither do you. And neither should you. Every one of us has the opportunity to do amazing work and to borrow from, you know, Matt, to borrow from Matt Heuser, to just plain be awesome. But we have to want to do that first. I realized a while back that because I was focused, I realized a while back because most of my career has been, you know, zigzag slants coming in through side doors here and there, that I haven't followed a traditional career path at all. And frankly, I'm really glad that I haven't followed a traditional career path because I really feel that The experiences that I've had, good, bad, up, down, insane, fun, exciting, they've all brought me to where I am today. They've all informed different aspects of my life and my career. I don't have, I've made, as I like to oftentimes say, I've made plenty of mistakes. 
but I made it a point to do my best to learn from them as much as possible. Mistakes I'm going to make. Every one of us is. I can live with mistakes. What I don't want to have is regrets. And fortunately, so far, there's very few. Thanks very much for letting me talk with you today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you, Think Test. Thank you, conference organizers. Thank you, Smita Mishra. Thank you, Dalit Bamare. Peace.